Today, a bill to weaken state ethics laws could make it easier for officials to avoid investigation. Ethics advocate and city council member Matt Carlucci calls it an assault on accountability. He'll join us later in the program. But first, between cyber attacks, expanding nuclear arsenals, and ongoing trade wars, it's a time of growing uncertainty and mistrust between the U.S. and China. I'm joined now by Robert Daly, director of the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Thanks for being here. Very good to be with you. And ahead of your speech tonight, Britt Hester, director of membership and communications for the World Affairs Council, which is sponsoring this event. Thanks so much, Anne. Thanks for being here. Robert Daly, you lived in and studied China about since you graduated from college. You even starred in a Chinese soap opera, and I want to get to that a little bit later in the program. But um, you began working in the late 80s, essentially, with China. How have you seen U.S.-China relations changed over that time? U.S.-China relations have changed along with China's changes. When I first got to China in 1987, this was before the Tiananmen Massacre in 1989, China was still extraordinarily poor. Parts of it, even around Beijing, borderline medieval. You could still see old women with bound feet uh, walking around in alleys. And so China has become, of course, very, very rich. They're the second largest economy in the world, first by some measures. And as China's become richer, it's done what almost any large country does when it gets wealthy, which is it tries to use its wealth to increase its power, its global influence. It tries to shape the global system, global values, global rules, to be more like its domestic rules. And that has essentially brought us into what I think is best understood as a new kind of Cold War with China. Because for China, trying to turn wealth into power means trying to find ways to spread the Chinese Communist Party's extremely illiberal domestic governance practices internationally. In other words, to make the, the global environment in which we have to operate more like China. Strong central governments, top down, fewer citizens' rights, a surveillance state. And so uh, we increasingly find ourselves at odds with each other politically, economically, technologically, geostrategically, even in terms of ideological issues. And I think that that will probably uh, be the case for several decades. And it doesn't bring me any happiness to say that. I've been deeply involved with China, have engaged with China. There's a great deal that I, I love and admire, and that I think we should all love and admire about the Chinese people and about traditional Chinese culture. There is not much to love and admire about the way the Chinese Communist Party sees the relationship between governments and individuals. That's where our focus should be. You do talk in, in some of your work about how they are practicing something that in many ways the U.S. also practiced in terms of you know, expanding wealth, attempting to uh, use its footprint to influence and change the global you know, environment. Um, and that they're taking a page in some ways from the model set by the United States. Yes, they are. I say any country that can uses its wealth to first make itself secure in the most narrow sense so that you wouldn't be invaded. And then you push your defensive perimeter outward. We have since World War II pushed our defensive perimeter so far outward that it comprises the entire globe. Most, I think, American citizens don't realize that America's policy, our foreign policy, is that we, as a matter of security, should not allow the emergence anywhere in the world of any regional hegemon. It means that there should be no country that has more power in its region than we can exercise in that region. We're number one. Now, the reason that people will nod and say, yes, we should do that, is because they believe that we are the good. It's okay for us to have global power because we're virtuous and people should understand that. Well, China thinks it's virtuous. They don't think they're the bad guy. Now, I think there are specific ways in which we can describe China as a, a, a bad player. Not a bad player across the board, but a bad player in terms of you know, top-down, non-democratic, non-transparent rulemaking and influence. There are real problems with China. But again, they don't think they're the bad guy. And they are an ancient civilization state, one-fifth of the world's population that has risen faster and more deeply than any other country. They feel like they've earned it. Uh, our idea is, well, you may be you know, bigger, you have more people, and your economy is growing. doesn't mean we just hand over the keys to the bus. You know, you, you've got to take it from us. And so we are increasingly in a, in a contentious relationship that draws in friends, allies, partners, the whole world. I mean, most national leaders 
have as one of their very top priorities navigating U.S.-China rivalry. The, um, you say, like, we are not seen as, or we see ourselves as, as sort of the virtuous component of this to you know, sure. uh, relationship. But, of course, America is not viewed necessarily as a, a good actor globally by a lot of countries. Um, and China has been able to use that fact in terms of, you know, our own failings internally or externally to good effect, you know, in terms of the carceral state in the United States and, you know, racial um, injustices. Um, talk a little bit about how the Chinese government has been able to use some of that, the facts about how this, you know, our own internal failings to their advantage. Sure. This came about uh, because for decades, the State Department every year has issued a China human rights report about all of China's human rights violations. Most countries uh, don't issue human rights reports every year about every other country on earth, uh, but we do. And there have been some very good impacts of that. We, we have changed some practices. Uh, but a lot of countries, certainly China, see it as arrogant, as an interference. And so they now issue an annual U.S. human rights report. Uh, they actually don't do that much investigation. A lot of it's plagiarized from American journalists and Americans' own work. But yes, they focus on the fact that we like to incarcerate more of our citizens than any other country on earth. Most of them are poor people of color. And so they speak a great deal about American racism and racial injustice. And uh, this helps them to win a lot of support, particularly in less developed countries, uh, what we're now calling somewhat uncomfortably the global south. Nobody really likes that term, mm -hmm. um, but that's the term that people are using. And they're successful not only in the global south, but among countries, and the list is fairly long, that don't want to have their decisions shaped by the United States, uh, that don't always experience American power as benign. And so, yes, as you suggest, um, it's America's racism, uh, it's incarceration. Uh, they also make great use of uh, what's going on with gun violence in the United States. You know, most of the rest of the world sees our gun laws as insane, uh, and they can use that. And also, um, both Xi Jinping and Putin in, in, in particular have been very successful in portraying America um, as just maniacally woke uh, in ways that most of the rest of the world don't agree. So there are aspects of American left side of American politics and the right side of uh, po American politics that strike many foreigners uh, as equally mad and that people like uh, Putin and Xi Jinping can use to win more uh, people to their causes. Well, if you have questions for Robert Daly about U.S.-China relations, you can email us at firstcoastconnect at wjct.org or you can call 904-549-2937. You can also reach out and message us on Facebook, Instagram, or X. Um, Brett, I want to bring you into the conversation just briefly. Why is it important to have a voice like Robert Daly come to Jacksonville and talk about an issue of, of such global significance um, on the local level? Yeah. <clears throat> so essentially the World Affairs Council, that's what we do. We bring the world closer uh, to the First Coast. And it's important because obviously <clears throat> we promote lifelong learning and then knowing these issues, what's going on, around the globe, you know, whether it's China, you know, we have someone coming to talk about Ukraine and Russia, what's happening there, knowing and being informed of what's happening and how that shapes our, you know, conversations here at home is, is vitally important. And so that's what the World Affairs Council exists to do. And uh, it's an exciting opportunity to bring these speakers here to Jacksonville. Robert Daly, there are so many challenges when it comes to this relationship. Um, the spy balloon, you know, is a, a, a large headline. I don't know if it was really significant in terms of that relationship, um, but certainly China is now looking at beefing up its nuclear arsenal, um, which could give it a, a very different role in terms of, you know, its in, its defense ability and its, uh, its ability to kind of set the stage. I think some people have said, you know, the way that we responded to the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, is dictated in part by their nuclear capabilities. Um, Taiwan tensions are a huge deal. Um, is there something that rises to the, to, uh, this, there was recently this information from Guam about this cyber infiltration of their systems, their electric and water grid essentially. Right. Is any of those come to the, the highest level for you as like the most concerning issue? Well, certainly uh, the Taiwan question is, the, that's the place where it's easiest to imagine actually uh, going to war with China. I still think that that is not a high likelihood event. I 
think that we can avoid it through more careful diplomacy as well as deterrence. But it's a more dangerous place than it was just a few years ago. Uh, China is, China's view is that Taiwan is part of an unfinished civil war and is none of our business. And that their view is that they will take it back. They would rather take it back peacefully and gradually if they can. But we should be in no doubt that if they thought Taiwan was slipping away irrevocably or if it declared independence, that they would move against it uh, militarily and that there's a very good chance then that we would be involved. It's, it's not certain. It would depend a lot on how that came down. But certainly it's more dangerous. And China also has expansionist territorial claims throughout the Western Pacific that involve the interests of allies like the Philippines, uh, potentially like Thailand. Uh, but it's the South, China sea, uh, the South China Sea and the Western Pacific are highly contested, and we have been the keepers of the peace there since World War II. We've been the offshore balancer, so our interests are very much involved. This is getting more dangerous. Again, I don't think that China is determined to move militarily on Taiwan in the short term. And I think that if we are smart and careful and work very closely with allies, uh, that we can avoid war with China. But it is getting more dangerous. Is it getting more dangerous because of things that we're doing, or is it getting more dangerous because of... Um things that China is doing. And I'm wondering in particular about, you know, visits that we've had from um, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy, like how those play in terms of, you know, poking the bear. So both China and the United States have been taking more dangerous actions. Uh, we have been poking the bear, poking the dragon, we usually say in the, in, mm. in the case of China, doing things to show them that we can, that we know are going to be provocative, uh, like the Pelosi visit. Uh, which do not make the Taiwanese any safer. You know, and this was brought home to the Taiwanese after um, Nancy Pelosi visited, and China then uh, did a number of things militarily, brought uh, warships, fired missiles much closer to Taiwan than they ever had. It did not make the Taiwanese safer. It was made, made them, put them in greater danger. And so when Kevin McCarthy had been speaking of going to Taiwan after he became Speaker of the House, Taiwan said, thanks, Please don't. Let's meet in California. Uh, they don't want this. We have changed the nature uh, of what we call our one China policy. Uh, we have moved closer to Taiwan in a number of ways. We now know it's public knowledge. We have American military trainers on Taiwan. All of this is very provocative for China, and we know it. They also have been far more threatening. Uh, fi they're flying far more bombers and warplanes uh, not into Taiwanese airspace, but getting closer and more regularly. Um, and their, their surface vessels are getting closer. We've both been more provocative. Taiwan, I think, and some of my Washington colleagues would disagree with me on this, has not been provocative, but it has changed. Of course it's changed since 1972. It's become a vibrant democracy. It's a leading trading partner of the United States. And most importantly, most people of Taiwan do not see themselves as Chinese anymore. They see themselves... As Taiwanese, that's something that's a existential threat to the Chinese government, and it's something that we rightly uh, feel bound to support. More and more, it seems that the you know the idea of China and concerns that people have about China has become part of political rhetoric, um, used you know for political gain or perhaps just to make a point. Um, I wonder how damaging or how influential, if at all, that is in the conversations that we're having globally with China when people are perhaps scoring points um, on China just to, you know, make a, 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 a significant dent here in the United States. So, again, America has many legitimate concerns about Chinese behavior, Chinese goals, Chinese actions. So I don't mean to say that there is no challenge there. There certainly is, and it is deepening. However, uh, there have been, there's been rhetoric and action on the American side that I think is damaging not only to U.S.-China relations, it's actually damaging to us. Uh, and I'm thinking of things like, yeah, I think it's now 33 states, in, including this one, Florida, uh, which are passing laws that say uh, that, that Chinese can't buy real estate within their state. Um, this is tremendously damaging. This is essentially telling the world's largest talent pool uh, that they are a despised class in the United States. Uh, one of the big advantages of our relationship with China over the past 40 years has been the brain drain. Hundreds of thousands 
of top people, especially in STEM fields, have come here and stayed. And typically they get PhDs uh, from United States universities, and then they go to work here, donate their talent, and over a period of time they first become green card holders and then citizens. What these laws say is that while they're doing this, building families, making their lives here, they, they can't buy homes. And so it's, it's pushing them out. And these people are not all Communist Party agents. I've heard a number of American governors say we are doing this to defend our people from the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, that's fairly deranged, and that's how it, it can read uh, within China. And again, we're pushing out talent that we badly, badly need. And so the, the rhetoric has run way ahead of the facts and I think actually damages American interests. I'm not concerned that it hurts Xi Jinping's feelings. That's not the claim here. It hurts us by keeping vital talent out. And yet, you know, considering what happens to China, you've talked about is not insignificant if we're talking about undermining the Communist Party there, if we're talking about destabilizing the economy in some respect. That is one-fifth of the global population that, you know, would be impacted. And so it's not just a question of how does it impact the Communist Party of China, but this entire enormous population on Earth that whose fortunes rise and fall to some extent with, with the countries. So this is, this is very difficult. We mostly speak about China as a political actor, and we lose track of China as a human proposition. And so the kind of question that we face now, especially because it is in many senses a new kind of Cold War, different from the first one, but it's a new kind of Cold War. And so this forces us to ask questions like, okay, China's economy right now is slowing. They're facing enormous challenges, the greatest that they've faced since 1978. Should our policy be to help China to fail so that it can no longer fund its political and its military expansion? That's, that's a fair question to ask. But of course, helping China to fail means directly harming the welfare of one-fifth of humankind. Is that where we want to be? That's a real dilemma because the Communist Party, insofar as China continues to develop and, and grow, the Chinese Communist Party can extract more resources that it can use to harm our interest in competition with us. But are we willing to harm you know, these individuals, extremely hardworking? Um, some of us, like me, are related to them. Uh, should that be our policy? That's a serious, very, very difficult question. How do we balance, as you suggest, the geostrategic and the human sides of this competition? I found your discussion about China really interesting, it, almost a little bit like a relationship counselor. Uh, um, <laughs> you've said that, you know, we're not necessarily asking the correct question, or at least not the right first question. Instead of asking what we want a country to do, um, we should be asking what? This is true not only of China, it's true of other countries as well. And, and here, this is something that uh, Dr. Kissinger wrote about a lot. I direct the Kissinger Institute. That doesn't make me Kissingerian in every way. Uh, I didn't work for Dr. Kissinger. But this is something that I think he has right. Uh, when you're dealing with another country, the first question is, why do they want what they want? What, what do they believe and why? What has their historical experience, their national mythologies, what has that taught them? You need to proceed from there if you're going to have an effective policy. You're all right. I was going to say it, it sort of compares to me. Um, the, there's a podcast by a very famous relationship um, counselor, Esther Perel, and she says the, the question that you should ask is not what some what you said, but what that person heard. You know, what are, right. it's not just a matter of asserting, you know, we want you to do this thing. But what is it that that country wants, in fact? Yes. And so China wants it depends on how you ask and depends on what you mean by China. Do you mean the Chinese people? Or do you mean the government? What the Chinese people want uh, is the same as what we want. Uh, they want to have a better life uh, for themselves, for their children. They want a good future. A growing number of them also do want more freedom uh, that the party wants. And they make a very strong case that we have a right, just like you, to develop. All of that is true and is deserving of our sympathy and understanding. The Chinese Communist Party believes in top-down, utterly non-transparent, secrecy is their crack cocaine, governance of all wise, all-knowing, all-powerful political elites. And they increasingly operate 
uh, through a surveillance state in what has to be called techno-totalitarianism. And they want world systems that are also non-transparent, top-down, uh, and run by technologically increasingly enabled governments. That's where it gets tough, uh, because that's no and hell no, even for international engagers like myself, you know, who admire a great deal about China. And so it can be very difficult to say, how can we counter a government which is increasingly oppressive at home and aggressive internationally without harming these folks? And throughout human history, there's never been a great answer to that. And we're struggling with it today. Um, I'm curious how you've seen the COVID virus impact the country of China insofar as that techno surveillance that you're talking about. I mean, obviously, there was this huge push from a health standpoint to track and make sure that people were not, you know, traveling outside of a zone where they might infect other people. Um, but that sort of remained in place, that architecture. The, the technological architecture is there. And if you want to purchase anything in China now, you do it with a QR code on your phone. If you want to hail a cab, almost anything that you do is tied to one of China's Uber apps. Uh, there's one called WeChat that, that most people use. And not only do they use it to pay for meals and pay for cabs, it's also their primary social media platform. It's their primary source of news. It's what they watch. You know, they watch cute cat pictures and all of this. This is sort of what Elon Musk wants to create. Right. And it's extremely dangerous because the government, or God forbid, Elon Musk, can capture all of this data. Uh, they can sell it. They can reuse it. They can process it. They can track you. In China, there are now in most major cities and even smaller cities, CCTV cameras everywhere on every street and in public spaces. And through use of big data and now artificial intelligence, they can use these cameras to take a picture of a crowd of one million people, know who those people are, know what they spend money on, know what websites they go to, know who their social networks are. And they even do uh, in China encrypted uh, increasingly something called predictive policing, which means that there is, for example, a, crimi a criminal type of way to hold your body, a posture that is worthy of suspicion. And they can note these using artificial intelligence uh, through these cameras. That's what China is increasingly becoming. And again, this is something we've got to be aware of and we have to be extraordinarily vigilant about. And so again, how do you balance the geostrategic concerns and our legitimate self-interest, not the barring people from buying homes, but legitimate self-interest uh, with a desire you know, to support the flourishing of one-fifth of humankind? And that's not really the conversation we're having, at least in Washington. It's much more hawkish uh, and aggressive and security-obsessed than what I've just described. We've got a couple of comments I want to just pass along and get to. Uh, Ed on Facebook says, China has no problem supporting it if it's to their benefit, any dictator and tyrant in the world. Unlike the United States, there is no Chinese people pressure not to help foreign dictatorships. There's a big difference. Um, Jay emailed, there's a substantial community of American expats in Taiwan. Any thoughts on how they would be handled in the event of China undertaking a military invasion of Taiwan? So uh, for the first question, Yes, uh, China is in many ways a geostrategic bad actor. Uh, they are supporting uh, Vladimir Putin in his invasion of Ukraine. They have drawn closer to Iran. Uh, they work very closely with North Korea, uh, with Venezuela. Uh, and so it can sound a little bit like a you know, sort of cartoon league of no goodniks. Um, <laughs> some of your listeners will be old enough to remember the old Bullwinkle and Rocky show which and the bad guys in that were you know boris badenov and natasha nogudnik and some of china's uh, international actions and their growing partnerships really do seem like a, a, a cartoon uh of that kind and we do need to combat that now again we need to be aware as we do so that we've supported our share of dictators too uh, when it supported us and so we need to not paint this in black and white. Uh, we need to have a good deal of introspection and historical self-knowledge uh, before we go preaching about absolute good and evil um, when our hands are in many ways also dirty. Uh, I would say not as dirty in the same way. And because we have political pluralism and freedom of speech, we've always had loud internal critics who have in fact made a difference. Uh, but the, that first questioner is, is correct, that China is working with other countries uh, who work 
very strongly against uh, American interests, and that's that's one of the things that makes this a new Cold War. Yes, there are Amer- a lot of American expats uh, in Taiwan, and uh, if China felt that it had to move against Taiwan, it would do so quickly, and whoever's on the island is on the island, and the, the, the chips fall where they may. Um, so this is something that uh, I would still move to Taiwan. I would still live there. I don't think an invasion is imminent, and Taiwan is a terrific place. But American expats always you know, are in dangers of this kind. So your mention of rocking Bullwinkle is going to make me move to a, a different topic about your own past in China, um, which not necessarily people would know, but you were a star on a soap opera for a number of years. Yes. Uh, and are actually hugely recognizable in China. Um, one of the most popular shows that has ever aired there. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it was hugely recognizable 30 years ago with the, the ravages of time. I think I'm, I'm a little less easy to, to pick out on the street. But this was uh, filmed in 19, 1992, 1993, and it was a 21-part series called A Native of Beijing in New York. And it was very well-timed because this is when you'd had the first major waves of Chinese, and especially Chinese elites, going to America to live and settling there. And obviously people in China were curious about why, why would they do that? What are their lives like? And that's what this television show purported to describe. Uh, and it starred a good friend of mine who's one of the great actors uh, and directors in China, a guy named Jiang Wen. And it was his show, and he was the one who really made it as great as it was. But the score was done by China's number one, sort of their, their Billy Joel, Elton John, you know, pop singer. So it had a lot of good music. Uh, some terrific actors. I was not one of them. Uh, one of our producers uh, was the uh, Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, who subsequently, subsequently became a very famous international dissident. At that point, he was living in an underground apartment uh, in the East Village, making his money at the blackjack tables in Atlantic City. Uh, he helped produce the show. So it was a coming together of people who already were or who would subsequently be superstars of Chinese culture, music, directing, acting the arts. And I was just through a a freak of luck was the number two male lead in what was essentially a racial, economic, sexual, one upsmanship competition kind of story. Uh, But I was on their shoulders. uh, And it was just one of a number of things in my career that have been freak Good luck. And know something that will be near and dear to NPR listeners' hearts. You also helped produce the Chinese language version of Sesame Street, which I think is a a great little detail. Robert Daly, just briefly, what can people expect to hear tonight when you're uh, addressing the the World Affairs Council Distinguished Lecture Series? So please uh, come join us uh, for this talk if you like. Hope to see you there. I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit more about why I think this is a new Cold War. What that means, including what that means for American citizens how long it's likely to last, what we should be aiming for, and what is the nature of this competition, because it is going to be shaping all of our lives uh, in numerous ways. One of the features of the Cold War is that opposition to the rival becomes an organizing principle of government, not just a concern of the garden, you know, garden variety concern, a real organizing principle of government, and that's happening. So how will that involve us? And then very importantly, uh, how will it not involve us? You know, those of us who grew up during the first Cold War, I was, I was born in um, Bossier City, Louisiana, Barksdale Air Force Base, uh, shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, and for us, you know, growing up during the Cold War really wasn't that bad, right? We still had the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and everything was going on mostly as normal. So we have to pay more attention to China in a Cold War way, but we also have to not panic. We need to focus in the right ways, understanding that a Cold War, while it's sinfully wasteful and costly and dangerous, is essentially a a play for time, is a stalling technique during which life still goes on in many ways. And so I'll be talking tonight about what we're stalling for, what we're waiting for, how a Cold War might end. But I'm mostly going to be giving listeners a, a description of where I think our real focus on China needs to be. And it's not necessarily on the things that you hear about most, like TikTok or Confucius Institutes or spy balloons. Uh, Those things are interesting but sort of marginal to the real competition that we're in with China. 
Robert Daly, director at the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute, will be speaking tonight at 7 o'clock as part of the World Affairs Council Distinguished Lecture Series. You can get tickets by going to worldaffairscouncil.org. Brett Hester, director of the World Affairs Council. Robert Daly, thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Anne.